Okay, so um, welcome to the uh, 2024 uh, edition of the uh, LibreOffice Google Summer of Code. Um, the project has concluded. This is the uh, panel uh, where we um, showcase all the projects, hopefully all of them. Um, we have um, lots of students here. Um, for some students who couldn't make it, we have a video recording. Sadly, not everybody could be here today and sadly we don't have a video uh, from everyone. But we will try, try to make do and at least uh, mention everyone uh, who's been participating. Um, hello. Right, so that's the uh, GSOC 2024 season. Um, if you find your, if you don't find your name there, um, um, beat me up right here on stage. Uh, I hope I <laughs> get everything covered. We had um, quite a long list of students there. We even had one extra project from the um, uh, Open Printing uh, Linux Foundation um, project for the uh, LibreOffice Print Dialog. Um, right, and we have. Uh, um, so maybe maybe have let's have a, we have a one and a half hours if I'm not mistaken. Does anybody knows how the uh, so so how many how many students are here in person? One, two, three, four. Okay, and I got one video and another mentor who's gonna read the slides. We got six, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, six presentations. And 90 minutes, so we've got plenty of time. <laughs> so how about everyone uh, comes back on stage and gives a quick introduction, just say your name, um, project you worked on, so we can associate that, a face to, to those titles and then we get going. Hi, my name is Sahil. Uh, I worked on LibreOffice Themes, uh, this one. And so it, it was about uh, color customizing the UI. Uh, so the user should be able to control it rather than letting it uh, in control of the operating system. Uh, so that, that causes many problems. Like on Windows, the dark mode is very dark. And so users wanted something better. And Heiko proposed this project and I was like, we'll see. And it, it works. Next one. Come all on. Everyone gets their turn. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohit Marathe, and I worked on comments in Sidebar. So we already have comments in Writer in the margin. So, but what? But why do we need uh, like a separate side, like a Sidebar panel for the comments? Because like when when there are too many comments, it becomes very uh, difficult to tell like which comment is pointing to which reference text. And uh, also having a separate sidebar panel makes room for uh, more functionalities like filtering and sorting. So Sarper was my mentor and Heiko my co-mentor. So thank you. Hello, uh, so I am Vishwadeep. I worked on uh, this one. I worked on CPDB support for the LibreOffice print dialog. Uh, so the uh, uh, for uh, so providing CPDB support, the point was to uh, ensure uh, that we decouple the print backend from the user interface. So this will help in providing support for multiple uh, printing technologies and this will uh, ensure that you do not need to write uh, relevant code for each and every technology you just uh, libreoffice just adapts uh, cpdb and then cpdb provides all the necessary support for print applications this will ensure that you do not need regular maintenance uh, to ensure that you uh, keep in uh, track with uh, every small change that occurs in the corresponding print technology thank you Okay, thank you. Hello, um, my name is Adam Siskunis. 
this one right here, more and better test. Uh, uh, Cisco and Hassan were my uh, mentors. Uh, the idea is to write uh, some tests. Uh, we started off uh, porting some tests from Java, some old tests. Um, I did, uh, I think, about four or five of those. Um, I apologize, I don't have a slideshow, um, but I had some stuff that I did. Uh, part of it was like uh, some really old tests, um, some database stuff. So, like, I ported over an old Java database so that there's like a whole suite of other tests that are in Java that. Um, now, if somebody else wants to go along and look at them, um, the database stuff's done. You just have to write the actual test, so it's a pretty good improvement. Um, and then I uh, went through and wrote a bunch of uh, missing, uh, looked at the missing uh, unit test wiki and uh, wrote a bunch of missing unit tests from that. Um, I think I did about 16 or 17 of those overall. Uh, I wrote some documentation um, that kind of outlines the process um, so that other people can use it to like get introduced to the project. It's like a pretty good thing to do for a new user. Um, look at a bug report, it gives you familiarity with that. Um, and then the process of uh, writing a bug and um, uh, uh, reverting the change and all that stuff. So um, it worked out pretty well. Thank you. Just adding you to the end of the, uh, of the role and you can have some free form presentation. Let me just uh, quickly fix that now that we can edit the slides while the presentation is showing. <laughs> Thanks, Armin. Okay, so um, running order for today. And anybody else? We, we got a video from uh, Divanj and we got slides from Rito Brocho. Um, anybody who's noticed anything else? I might have missed it. There's lots of things happening. Um, anybody who's seen maybe from TDF staff something uploaded somewhere on Nextcloud? I might have missed it. So if, if anybody finds some uh, further students, so I haven't, I haven't seen anything from Ahmed, nothing from Aung. Uh, I think everybody else is either here or sent something. So uh, running order for today would then be, we start with uh, slides from Venetia and uh, Stefan will present that. Okay. So I'll stand in for Venetia, who unfortunately couldn't come. Uh, she's in North America, and uh, I think uh, university studies season already started again over there, so she couldn't make it. Um, but over the summer, um, what she did is um, work on a Lua you know, language binding. So Lua is this little scripting language um, that is, I think uh, it was started by some Brazilian people back in, don't know, quite a time ago, quite a while ago. Uh, I had personally never used it myself, uh, just ended up somehow on this uh, ideas page for people to uh, grab us as mentors. And uh, when Vinicia came across, uh, came along, I of course said, yes, sure, I can do that. Learn some Lua myself uh, over the summer. Um, so yeah, that's what um, what happened there, the, the you know, uh, language binding, uh, quite mature and uh, well used within LibreOffice. Oh, do come in. Um, and we have all these bindings to all these different languages from C++ to Java to Python uh, to more uh, dynamic scripting languages as well. Um, JavaScript, for example. Um, also our venerable BASIC has a binding with, with you know. Um, and so that's uh, naturally extendable to, to other languages. Um, and that's what, what uh, Venetia did over the summer. Uh, so it was structured into some, um, yeah, next slide probably. So um, it was structured into getting, getting the, the, the framework for this uh, done and then having all this list of, you know, has all these uh, different uh, types. Of, of data types uh, and that of course always for every different language that needs a, a, a kind of an idea of how to map that to that other language and, and Lua is a very simple language 
is only has uh, it only has some uh, some built-in types like numbers and a string and uh, not even a character type. It uses numbers for the individual characters. So it is a in in a sense it is a very low-level language. And then it has for for building abstractions building abstractions upon that. It just has an idea of a table which is a dictionary of uh, key value pairs and from that you can then build uh, your what what in other languages are classes and and objects implementing these classes and uh, but at the at, at that level it is a very very simplistic and, and simple language um, which has just a very few basic data types so some of these you know types even collapse onto a single uh, Lua uh, data type like all these different uh, you know number types for the signed and unsigned and 16 and 8-bit and whatnot they all lump into a single Lua number type and then you have the the fun part when you map them back as, as any's or, or stuff like that <laughs> um, next slide so um, yeah as I said uh, the, the the idea of, of how to to map these things was one of the big uh, blocks in there and, and then we had some uh, kind of elaborate uh, testing framework there. Uh, the, the nice thing was that in parallel to uh, mentoring uh, Venetia on the, on the Lua part, I was also working in a completely different uh, uh, environment on this uh, mbind uh, wasm scripting, uh, javascript wasm scripting uh, stuff for via, you know, so I had already written up a large uh, testing framework myself for or lots of testing code uh, for different you know things. And then I told Venetia, yeah, you have clock here, I have something for you to, to reuse there, <laughs> which then made it a bit easier for her to get, to get into that uh, and get that done. So it was uh, quite a lot of testing code used in, in making sure to, to have it working. Next slide. And uh, the results are uh, blue on blue. Unfortunately, that's the line down here. So all this, the, the resulting code all ended up in this uh, Git repo that we have uh, for the SDK examples, because in the end, it's just one, one more um, way of, of using the SDK. Uh, and it, of course, if, if you want to try it out on your machine, you need a Lua um, runtime, a Lua executable or Lua um, library, um, and we don't want to uh, enforce on on uh, the the, um, the the main uh, LibreOffice build that you also you would always need that. So if you want to uh, program in Lua, you need to install this uh, Lua locally on your machine, and then you can uh, use the extra Git repo to try it out. Next slide. And yeah, as I said, um, what did Venetia learn during the summer and what also did I learn during the summer about Lua is how Lua has this own concept of a stack and how that works uh, quite different from, from the other actual runtime stack. Um, how to use the UNO framework, how to get this uh, into the UNO framework, this, this uh, little scripting language. The test environment, as I said, um, all this uh, mapping of the, of the uh, all the getting getting happy for all the data types that we have, um, and then Lua is yeah, as I said, just a, a simple scripting language, a small, uh, toted to be easily embeddable. So it has a C API, um, which makes available all the functionality. So what this uh, bridging actually is is uh, to have this this uh, Lua C interface. To then map to the um, to the LibreOffice, uh, you know, native, you know, uh, code in, in C++. So a, a kind of a three-step thing there. And finally, summer somehow ends early <laughs> sometimes, and uh, there's still things for improvement. But uh, Inisha is uh, confident to to keep sticking around, which is always a good thing if. We have students that are eager to spend the summer with us and then not disappear into the void, but keep contributing. And I guess there's yeah, some minor things still that could Im have improvements there and places everywhere in the, uh, 
elsewhere in the code base that could benefit as well from fresh new great developers. So great to have her. Any questions for the moment? So we are done with this one. Yeah, I go by this nickname on IRC, and it sometimes help me helps me hide my age on other channels. So when I tell them I'm 21, they are like, "Oh, I thought you are 41 or maybe older." And I'm from India, and I've been contributing since 2023. And like, these are the things I worked on. Uh, yeah. So the project was uh, we discussed it, right? But uh, there were two parts to it. So first part was enabling color customization. So the user should be able to tweak each color, like each uh, that word. It doesn't mean each daily, like uh, component wise. And uh, it's the second one was to make it uh, available via an extension. So instead of uh, changing each color by hand, they should be just able to install an extension and change the theme. And it should work. And it works most of the times. So let's look at some. This is uh, how GTK looks by default. Like I just installed Arch Linux, and this is how it looks. And I applied some theme, and this is how it looks. So, but like there are some issues. So in this one, uh, the shadows are overlapping with the font. So we will fix it like, as as the feedbacks come. So uh, this is uh, cu cute, and uh, uh, no, no, this this. Can we go back? Yeah, so this is GTK, but uh, it's it's a dialogue example. How a dialogue looks. And so this is how it looks after applying an extension. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we uh, it's not enabled by default. So uh, we are not forcing the user to opt in. And uh, so we added this uh, custom control where this will be selected by default, and uh, the user can change it to that one. And when they change, only then uh, will it be enabled. And even then, it won't be selected by default. They have to uh, go there and like uh, change it from automatic to a custom theme, which they install either by clicking here and like clicking on download, or by downloading it from the extension site and uh, by like going to tools, extensions, and add extension, and then rebooting the system. Uh, yeah. Uh, one, yeah, so on this one, uh, we removed the dark light uh, to toggling mechanism. So before this, we had this uh, uh, combo box, and is it combo box? Yeah. So we had the, we ha we had something like this. It's combo box, and it had three options: automatic, uh, light, and dark. And those were mostly hard coded colors. So we removed it, and it's like uh, we we are trying to come up with a better solution than just uh, like bringing it it back and. Uh, putting it next to it, next to what we came up with. Maybe, maybe we can uh, we can ask the theme creators to create a themes in pairs. Like, so suppose I'm a theme creator, so I'll create a custom theme light and a custom theme dark, for example. But like, we are looking for a solution. Next one. Uh, so how it works? Uh, so. <laughs> The uh, components which interact to make this possible are like very separated. Uh, so the colors are stored in registry, which is like a store on the system. And uh, the VCL plugin code, it, it, it handles the uh, putting back of the colors into the system. So I had to make, uh, find a way to um, make them communicate in sync. So it's not like uh, the VCL uh, says, OK, you are ready to use the custom colors. But it didn't re read those colors, so like it should happen in a sequence. Uh, so, so basically, it. Uh, so what I did, I placed some printf statements in uh, all the suspected areas, and I uh, ran ran the application two three times and interacted with it. So I so, saw a pattern. Basically, the VCL plugin starts first, the, then uh, the color color config uh, object is created, and then it loops. So first, uh, uh, let, let us say you are starting the application for the first time. Uh, so the VCL plugin, uh, VCL plugin code, it, it says, OK, I loaded the colors from the widget toolkit. 
and it marks a flag in the style settings. Style settings is used to communicate, uh, exchange style data, basically. Uh, so it marks a flag. Uh, then uh, the color config, uh, when the color config uh, object is created, uh, it checks, okay, so the VCL plugin has loaded the system colors. So it takes those and uh, it loads them into the registry. It checks a registry entry whether it's the first boot or not. If it's the first uh, first start thing, then uh, it overrides the registry f uh, with the system colors. So basically, we get the default colors that way. And after that, whenever you start, those default colors are used, unless you res uh, reset the colors. Mm. Am I complicating it? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought so. So let's uh, take it like this 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 uh, this part of the screen is uh, vcl plugin this is color config which is basically a registry but in code registry is xml and in code you interact with it via color config and uh, what is this thing? let's leave that so this this via style settings tells this like okay i have loaded the colors you have something uh, if it's the first start wait I, I'm just explaining the code line by line. <laughs> it, it's fine, right? Uh, so this, uh, the VCL plugin tells the color config that, okay, you have the colors, be it the default colors or the custom colors that the user set. And that color config, uh, when the color config is created, it creates another object in the style settings with those colors, those custom colors. And so the style settings, basically after the first start, the style settings has a custom uh, object named uh, theme colors. What is it? Yeah, theme colors. And the theme colors object has the uh, updated uh, custom colors for the UI. Mm, and uh, in the color config, we, <laughs> we, lo we load this object into the style settings and we, we mark this. So we say theme state loaded. So yeah, theme has been loaded. Color config marks it in the style settings. Uh, then uh, in the update settings functions in the VCL plugins, uh, we put we put those colors back into the widget toolkit, and then the widget toolkit reads those colors, and basically the style settings gets the colors from the theme colors object instead of the widget toolkit. Th this was the most difficult part. Otherwise, like, it was just like, uh, creating getters and setters and like this and that. But uh, this is how the communication happens. Why are passing flags? So, yeah, th this is the uh, what should I say? Pathway which the colors go through. So it's always re always registry then the theme colors object which is static. So like same throughout the system, and then the VCL plugin uses those colors. So if the user changes some color, suppose, so it it goes via this route only, not the other way around. Like. Uh, so this is uh, cute and like there, there was an interesting problem. So like the project was uh, it it wasn't big in terms of uh, complexity, but it there were many patches to handle it. There were four VCL plugins and one patch for the ma main course. Uh, so I I was juggling between them like okay someone remo re reviewed on that patch okay I need to reply so I I'll change a branch and then. So uh, sometimes it, it happened that uh, I would work on one plugin for it for one day, and then I, I'll come back to it after a week. And somewhere, uh, Qt, Qt introduced a bug, or I should say, uh, KDE introduced a bug. KDE introduced a bug in its theme theme, its breeze, right? And and so when you change colors on KDE, can we go to the next? Slide? The menu bar doesn't uh, respond to that, and uh, so it, it it was responding, but said all of a sudden it stopped responding. So, can, can. Uh, so I reported this bug, and it was verified. So now it's a bug in the desktop environment rather than R patches, but maybe I I'll have to solve it. Let's see. Next. Uh, okay, no screenshots for Windows and Mac. Sorry, but like. I, I had some visa issues and like it came on the very last time and <laughs> I had to run. And uh, today when I tried uh, building it, I, I saw lo Lord, Lord, load has changed a lot. It's not the same. You don't just clone it and run dot slash setup. 
it's like you have to clone ant as well and like i, I don't know it it didn't work i'm sorry i, I i'll share it afterwards like next step please yeah so future plan uh so first like we we are just done with the color customization and it has rough, rough edges as well so like uh, we need reviewers first of all like the windows patch and the mac patch Ma mac os patch uh, th they are not reviewed yet so if if someone uh, who, who's sitting here and who, who's expert in those areas i would request you, you can like review those patches uh, so assuming that i i'm done with those so i i i uh, not uh, we plan to work on i and the mentors like mentors are important <laughs> Uh, so uh, we plan to work on the notebook bar color customization so color and bitmap customization and uh, app background so uh, there there is this document and we have some area vacant on on the back background so hiko suggested that we can add a custom bitmap to it like people would like having a wood, wooden background behind their uh, documents so it's another thing in pipeline we 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 plan to work on it then a better alternative to uh, toggle light and dark yeah we talked about it yeah and so the title bar is managed by the desktop environment rather than the uh, uh, application so we plan to hide it and uh, draw a custom one so that we can customize it according to themes talking of custom title bar like if you are drawing a custom title bar then uh, it opens ma many gates like we can implement a tab ui on it just an idea like i thought of it so like this is the title bar it will have the buttons and we can have tabs uh, this is the source of this image next one uh, what is yeah a token of thanks to the reviewers thanks to michael uh, <laughs> he helped me clean a lot and uh, so uh, one thing like the project was 70% complete and then one day i sa sat down on the computer and uh, i don't know I, i was like you know you know in some horror things you have an intuition like something is wrong and you start running away so i, I saw my code and i was like uh, i i need to turn the computer off and I, i went to sleep so like i had to take a break and like clean the code afterwards it was like if theme not activated then if it's automatic theme if it's so i had to clean it a lot and like yeah it it works and now it's a lot cleaner maybe that's what we call code smell i don't know thanks <laughs> and uh, questions please if if any like okay if there's any questions later on if you think about something and then it has to just a uh, kind of uh, uh ferment in your head then uh, um, until when are you guys around until saturday sunday so we can still talk to you with questions i say cool. good um so the next one is uh, Rito Brotto uh, but i don't think we got any video recording from him if i should have missed that anywhere i apologize um but i was uh, even asking around uh, but um, no one seems to have seen that so i will try to um go through that i was co-mentoring that uh, with hossein uh with a bit of help also from stefan um and uh cloth and uh, random other people um on uh, on irc uh it's another one uh it's another language binding for um for you know uh, in this particular case for the dot net uh, uh group of languages um we had something there uh for c sharp but it was kind of uh, old and rusty and dusty and um i think uh, windows only uh, which is never great so the objectives uh when when we started um was um to have cross platform support for the dotnet uh, 8 um um then get some like a bit closer to the developer experience that for example we have for java since i don't know 25 years or something so so that there should be some pa easily installable package in the respective packaging ecosystem which is nuget in this case 
so that developers can easily just say install blah and then start with the example and it would just run out of the box without uh, having to spend a day uh, to set it up. Um, uh, and then some nice um, newer features like generics and extensions um, and get rid of um, crafty old code that was um, tied to the old implementation. And also because .NET is a platform also adds support for the other languages. Uh, they are not just uh, C Sharp as we had before. Steps taken um, was first of all to get all the support libraries and code into the build system. Uh, which actually took a considerable amount of time, probably I think about half of the effort was uh, spent there initially. Um, yeah, to get it to build with GNU Make and other annoyances. Um, then uh, get it all uploaded and uh, building in CI and get all the, um, the Jenkins builders um, equipped with that. And so, so quite some steep learning curve. Uh, for Vito Brotto to get into all those um, nitty gritty details, kind of cross cutting, uh, you need to you need to deal with the build system, you need to do with infra, you need to deal with all the people um, who are um, uh, who need to do. Then you need to ask them to do something, and then you're getting told, no, we're not going to do anything, but you have to uh, do that in LODE, and then we might just automatically do that. So yeah, I think overall, as a mentor. Um, that was one of the harder projects, um, but also probably most educating from from an experience. Um, yes, and yeah, I just mentioned that the CI integration, uh, so, so that um, the, the patch that was submitted relatively early on would then actually pass uh, on CI. Um, unit testing, getting that working early on, uh, that was quite appreciated um, to have that. Um, on the screen, the NuGet package, so so that would be then completely different, but like uploaded there, and so that um, it's possible then to kind of start developing out of Visual Studio Code with just a uh, with just a click, um, and then came the um, let's say the technically, so like on on the face of it, the the most challenging work, but which turned out to be not. In comparison, that that hard and long winding because all the other everything that involves like having to deal with humans or complex, crafty processes tends to be um, t tends to take much longer than than expected. And and so this uh, out of process bridging, um, uh, yeah, that was uh, then I think in comparison, she was really enjoying that that bit, which was we I, I thought that would be the the the, the largest part of the project, and so yeah. Uh, there was that. Um, and he also did then in the end port a number of examples uh, so that, um, yeah, it's always nice to have an example. Like It's nice to, to be able to install the, the build tools, but then if you don't have an example, you're still probably scratching your head and trying to find code somewhere uh, for the next day. So to in particular when it's about you know um, and the, um, the weirdness there, so having some SDK examples ported, that was some quite nice. So so all in all, pretty uh, pretty complete um, uh, project now uh, that should, of course, nothing is ever done in software land, um, but it's um, it checked all the boxes um, for that project, and let's hope that's uh, uh, um, now relatively easy. At least that you can iteratively with very small steps like add value to that. Uh, to that feature set. Um, right, that's the list. Uh, what's um, what immediately came to mind? Um, this components thing. Uh, so that that's a way to package that, um, and then being able to use that from Java or Python or Basic, um, and um, that's this uh, essentially being able to build extensions um, with that. Always good to have more examples and tests. Uh, at some stage, dropping the old framework, once this is um, at least on feature parity, that would probably need at least one major release of deprecating that if we haven't done so. Um, yeah, and then the fully managed version, um, that is uh, probably 
a GSOC project in its own right. Um, and it's probably need it probably needs to be out of process, but I'm I was not diving that deep into that bit. Um, but yeah, it might be a GSOC project for the next year. I, I, I hear that students can contribute at least twice. Right, so thanks for Richard, to Richard Brotto um, for uh, doing an excellent job here. Um, it's all merged uh, and I think he's sticking around. So let's see uh, what the future brings there. Uh, next one up would be, oh, any questions? Sorry. Okay, next one up would then be Devansh and uh, with the mentor Tomaj, but I have a video, so I would just play that. If you call and then you can be on stage for answering questions. Code for the view, 
instead of uh, you know copying and pasting the code again and modifying it according to our need, which we don't need it in for the view because all we had to just run the bar. So uh, we use the object oriented property of inheritance and there it is what we did. We just call the create chip and further on it called the do z slot and do x slot or those two other methods further on the side. So as you can see, the data interpreter code is here. It's basic data interpretation. I think we also had this for column line chart type. So it's sort of a having those properties from there. Simple. Uh, for uh, in the beginning and the initial time, I modified when we were modifying the bar chart code. I set the gap width to zero, and that's how it was looking at that time. Then we had to, you know, after having those interpretation is done, we had to calculate the bars and for the calculation we're using Scott rule because Microsoft is also using Scott rule so we have to strip it back so the user can have interoperability between MS Office and LibreOffice so they don't run into problem. And this is a formula for Scott normal reference and that's what the code is doing basically. So you can find that about here at supportmicrosoft.com there is a link and you can see that calculation part has been modified and added in this particular PR. And that's what, uh, after having that calculation as the formula, uh, after that having that formula as the calculation, we started having bars which were visible, which were quite similar like Microsoft's one. And there's a little bit of tweak which we need to have, but that's okay. Then we have uh, the spreadsheet uh, compared with Google Sheet. Google Sheet is having a bit different formula, so that's why you're seeing a bit difference between winning and the frequency count, which makes sense. Uh, then there is uh, the, another tool to call was ODF and OA, OOXML in code and export. Um, I ran into a big trouble here because our code base doesn't have the support for OOXML for these new charters because Microsoft introduced an entire namespace for this, and that was a painful thing to know at that very end, to, at end time of the period of GSOC. And this is where we actually, I tried to open an XLX file, uh, which was created with Google Sheet, and that's how it was opening. It was creating a simple bar chart, which didn't we want, which we want, which we don't want here. And uh, as you can see, I then created an XLS file with the Microsoft Excel 2016 and onward, and you can see there is this message which is popping up, and that didn't really make much sense. And it, 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 so we started digging down into the newly created Excel sheet, uh, which is basically the XLS file. Uh, it's a zip file. Basically, it's a zip file, so we opened it as a zip file and we started looking at each individual XML file which it had. And then there we can see the same message which we rendered here as previously when we opened the XLX file with our newly created uh, OOXML support, which uh, was hitting this, which means we don't have support for this new chart type in space. And uh, you can find about this up this link here, also the Microsoft also had. So it is an entirely new chart name space which was created by Microsoft is Excel chart EX, which is basically this. And what we had is chart X, not chart EX. So uh, these are the new chart types which were introduced post 2016 MS Office, and these are the already existing chart types which we also have in our LibreOffice code base. So here's a difference. That's what actually created a problem. And uh, then uh, not just the basic uh, already existing billing calculation, which is done by Scott Formula, we also had an option uh, provided by Microsoft is custom billing. So we also introduced that, and here is uh, those images. And this is where those uh, custom billing uh, options are there. So if you select the checkboxes, there is also an input box where you can input the overflow and underflow bin, and based on that, we can have the calculation calculated. But we still don't have that those calculations being calculated here. And that's still a problem which we are working. And the UI is permanently working, it has the options for the custom billing, but it still have to manipulate those calculations behind at the back end. Uh, we still have to add ODF support for import and export. For OXML, we have to add an entire structure to parse it, to read it, and to write. 
So that's an entire additional work which you have to do. So that other new charters can use this functionality well. So that's going to be a good thing which we have to do. Then Collector Chart is also left. The user species is going to be pretty much a copy or replica of this already existing Instagram chart. You know, and they're going to be not that tough or challenging. And the remaining charts also needs to be introduced. So that's all that we have in this. And that's all I did. So thank you for having this opportunity and giving uh, me this opportunity and I really enjoyed working here and I have to complete this uh, remaining task. Uh, remaining things could be found here in more detail with the mails and everything on the blog and that's what we did. Thanks. Any questions from anyone? Okay, then let's move on. Uh, next one uh, would be Bishwadeep. So yeah, uh, I worked on integrating common print dialog backends into the LibreOffice print dialog. So who am I? In short, I'm the printing guy. To give a more formal introduction, I'm a Google Summer of Code contributor working on integrating common print dialog backends into the LibreOffice print dialog. Uh, so why print dialogs? So print dialogs might seem like a small part of any software application, but uh, for user, uh, but for a user, it is very important to improve their user experience. Uh, so, uh, when, uh, for example, let's say user is printing. Uh, so if a user wants to print something, their interaction with the uh, print dialog uh, determines how smooth their experience is. Uh, so keeping these print dialogs up to date is necessary uh, to ensure a seamless user experience. Uh, so what is CPDB? We're talking about CPDB. What is CPDB? CPDB or Common Print Dialog Backends is a software developed by Open Printing which decouples the print backend from the user interface. Uh, so this ensures that, uh, for example, taking the example of uh, LibreOffice, so this ensures that if uh, uh, LibreOffice has adapted uh, CPDB, then uh, LibreOffice does not have to worry about uh, making regular updates uh, to provide support for new and upcoming te uh, print technologies, or even for uh, providing support for already existing print uh, updates in already existing print technologies. Uh, so uh, uh, this in uh, okay. So let's talk about how it decouples the print, uh, print uh, technology uh, backend from uh, the user interface. How does it exactly happen? So the print job is uh, created by the user. The print job calls the CPDB frontend API. The CPDB frontend API on the basis of the job attributes that are sent by the users decides upon which uh, print backend it wants to use. Let's say the uh, print backend uh, that the user supplied is uh, backend A. So it will, uh, CPDB frontend uh, API will then uh, uh, extract all the jo uh, job attributes from the uh, job uh, created, from the job that is created, and it will send the relevant information uh, to the print backend, and the print backend will print the job. Uh, so let's talk about some important aspects that had to be taken into consideration while uh, 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 while designing the solution. So the first was to ensure dynamic updating of printer lists. This is important because uh, let's say there are two printers A and B and uh, while, uh, and, uh, on, uh, while the print dialog is open, one of the printers gets disconnected and the user uh, tries to print on that uh, uh, that uh, same device. So he will get an error and he might not know the reason for that error. So uh, having dynamic updating of printer lists helps because uh, it uh, tells us, uh, because it uh, will remove that printer uh, from the printer lists. Uh, so it will ensure uh, that the user has a better experience. Next, please. So how did we do that? We did that using uh, debus signals. Uh, so initially my approach that, that uh, involved using CPDB's API uh, calls, uh, callback function. So CPDB for the purposes of its own uh, 
uh, user user facing interface it has its own uh, callback functions as well as debug sig uh, signal handlers so uh, the, uh, so uh, initially i used uh, that uh, callback function however i tailored the debus uh, call uh, debus call handlers to uh, su uh, suffice uh, with uh, LibreOffice's needs. So uh, in my initial implementation, the debus call handlers handled the uh, LibreOffice's printer list and it called the CPDB frontend API functions to handle CPDB's printer list. Next please. But uh, the issue with that was that uh, it involved uh, uh, low level handling of uh, CPDB structures, which would in fact lead to uh, higher maintenance uh, later, uh, which is which would uh, be counterproductive. So later uh, we uh, went on to use CPDB's uh, API debus calls that would handle uh, CPDB's printer list, and uh, I designed custom uh, uh, custom callback that is tailored to uh, LibreOffice that would handle LibreOffice printer list. So the, now the question would come that why do we need two uh, printer lists? This is because uh, the uh, LibreOffice's printer list is uh, used for uh, showing the printers to the users. Whereas CPDB needs its own printer list uh, to uh, provide the print job and get all the options and stuff. So uh, a synchronization between the two is very essential. Uh, another important aspect uh, of the project was to ensure that uh, the user could read the options that were obtained from the printer. This is because the options uh, that uh, you can get from a printer are usually in the IPP format, which, not be, which may not be correctly interpreted by the user. So this, uh, and they also may not be in the user's desired language. So this would uh, later cause problems because uh, let's say a user understands only German and you are given uh, the uh, like the IPP attributes are in English. So that will cause a problem. Next. So to deal with that, we introduced human readable translation support. So for that also we had two approaches. Initially, uh, we go, went to uh, get uh, the for like while handling each and every option, uh, each option would be sent to the uh, CPDB API function in the backend that would uh, translate the uh, options uh, from that would translate the options and uh, return back the translated option and that would be displayed to the user but the issue was that it in involved multiple uh, debus api calls so it was very slow it was making the application very slow so the later uh, implementation involved getting all the translations beforehand so we make one single uh, debus api call and that gets all the translation and it stores it Later, uh, the, this also prevents low-level handling of CPDB structures. And uh, well, later, when the option, the translations for the options are needed, uh, then uh, you uh, can get it from that uh, from the already retrieved CPDB options by using a uh, CPDB API function that I created. Next. So. Uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. And I am really grateful to my mentor, Michael Weghorn. He has been a great support and I've learned a lot from him. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, it is, <laughs> it is difficult uh, to get a printout because uh, you need to uh, take into consideration, uh, like, uh, uh, because you need to take into, uh, could you please clarify? I didn't exactly get what you meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because uh, you need uh, drivers for that. For example, even if you use Windows, you need to install the requisite drivers for that. In Linux, uh, CUPS is providing support for printers. Uh, initially, what was happening uh, till now, and it is still there in the LibreOffice's implementation of CUPS, that they are using PPDs. But uh, the, in the recent versions of CUPS that has been introduced, we are going for PPD-less. So with that, it helps because uh, not uh, there are not necessarily, you can't get uh, all the PPDs of, uh, for example, all printers. The newer printers that are there, not all of them have PPDs. So we are working for a more universal approach that can help uh, so suffice for any and every printer that is there.
या पी पी डी मीन्स लाइक अ सॉर्ट ऑफ फाइल दैट डिफाइन्स ऑल द स्टैंडर्ड्स एंड ऑप्शन फॉर ईच प्रिंटर एनी मोर क्वेश्चन थैंक यू Okay. Um, so next one would be uh, Adam and um, uh, Mohit. I wonder. Um, I haven't seen any slides from you. Maybe you sent them, or you sent. Okay. So um, while Adam uh, has his uh, freeform talk, I figure out the slides, uh, and then you do that. So Adam, please. You you said you you have some. You just you do just ad hoc. You just explain what you did. And you buy me, and you buy me five minutes, and I, I thought that. <laughs> yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like I had said earlier, um, we started off uh, just porting some tests um, from. And I'd like to thank Cisco since he's here now for helping me out for being my mentor. Um, started uh, porting some old tests that were uh, in Java um, over, and um, ran into some issues. Uh, like a lot of those Java tests hadn't been touched in a long time. Um, they were poorly documented um, and. A lot of times, uh, stuff doesn't map one to one in the C++, even though you think that it would. So I kind of ran into some issues there. Um, just moved on to some other stuff. Eventually, found um, uh, Cisco's suggestion. Um, these database tests. There's like a whole suite of database tests. The database was written to populate using Java. So the first thing I did was um, port that over so that it does it in C++. It's like pretty straightforward, but um, obviously you always run into issues with that stuff. Um, so the idea was to get that done. Um, and then there's a whole suite of other tests that you could do afterwards. I ran out of time. Um, I think I ported one or two of the um, old Java tests over to C++. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, any other test like down the line or uh, functionality that uses the database could then can use um, if you have some kind of for a base. It's kind of lightly touched, but um, you could use that database. It's all there. Um, there's. I wrote like one test, like it, it which is you know kind of good to have that you can look um, if you just grep, um, and it gives you basically like how to set up the database, the connection, um, how to query it, and check the results. So it's kind of like a you know how to if you look into the files. Um, useful for other people when they're looking at it, um, and then. Um, we moved on to, um, uh, that was the first half of the project. Uh, we kind of set it up that way. It was to look at the Java test. Um, moved on to um, porting tests or writing tests um, from the missing test wiki. Um, in that like transition, I started running into some issues with, uh, like when you're writing, when you take an old bug report, um, a lot of them are like 10 years old, 15 years old, and you try to revert the commit to try to recreate the bug. Um, I started running the issues with my build. Um, I was using Fedora, um, and so Haseen, like, after just kind of like struggling with it, and I would like make clean and rebuild, it would take an hour, you know, just kind of not getting a lot of stuff done. He asked, like, are you, what are you using? And I'm using Fedora. He's like, that's probably not a good idea. You should switch to Ubuntu. Um, I did that, which, you know, like took like a full day of, you know, like switching everything out. And at that point, um, you're kind of thinking to yourself, is it worth it? And it was, very well worth it. Uh, I had no problems after that. So just to anybody else who's listening to this, use the safe choice. Don't gamble. Um, save yourself a lot of headaches down the line. Um, and then, uh, so writing these uh, missing unit tests, um, you know, it's just a process of going through, looking at old bug reports, figuring out whether the bug report has a good way to reproduce the bug. Sometimes, you, like, all bug reports aren't created equal. You look at a bug report, um, it's kind of confusing how to recreate it, or there's like, it's not, um, you know, clear that someone reproduced it, or maybe it's like ambiguous. And so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of old bug reports in the missing unit test. So basically what I would do is I would go through and just find good candidates. And also when I was starting out, it helpful just to have some success. So you just kind of find something that's pretty easy, start with that, write the test, and then move on from there. Um, I found, uh, you know, some good ones. And then also, uh, the other thing I didn't mention before was uh, Hossein had mentioned that um, I should probably focus on the area of test. Uh, I decided, to or at his suggestion, I focused on import-export bugs because those are pretty annoying for the user. Uh, like, generally, like, you take an, uh, a, a Word document, you try to open it up, and, like, 
the thing, you know, the everything's misformatted or uh, it won't, it crashes, which is the easy one. And so these were like bugs that had been fixed a long time ago, but no one ever wrote a unit test for. So I started working on those. Uh, a lot of crash tests are super easy to write the test for. Open it up, see if it crashes. You know, do those. Uh, the hard part is generally reverting the bug fix and making sure everything's working right. Yada yada yada. Um, and so then uh, I kind of got the process down after you know going through. And so at the end, I wrote as many tests as I could. I, I kind of fe fell a little bit short because the issues I had with the operating system. I wanted to try to get like up into the thir almost 30, um, but no, no big deal there. Uh, so at the end, uh, I wrote this documentation that kind of goes through the process. Um, and you know, uh, like if you're familiar with building and kind of developing, it's not so bad. But for a new user, I think it incorporates a lot of stuff uh, with a project like Bugzilla. Uh, reading bug reports. Uh, once you start reading a lot of bug reports, it, it, it becomes clear when you file a bug report how to make it clear for the people down the line. So I think that's kind of helpful too. Um, so like the documentation um, goes through for someone that was like a new user, like here's the steps you need to uh, do to take a bug from the missing unit report, uh, revert, the uh, revert it, test it, write the test. I don't get into like a lot of detail about how to write the test necessarily, but just kind of the steps that are necessary. So I think it's a good way um, for new new contributors to get into the project. Writing tests is a, um, you know, it's a pretty low stakes uh, con contribution. It's not something that's going to cause a problem down the line necessarily. So it's less, you know, intimidating maybe for people that uh, contribute. So um, all the tests that I wrote, hopefully they're run on the CI. They hope uh, they help these um, bugs that were sitting there forever that have been fixed from getting reintroduced. Hopefully, because I you did looking through bug reports, I did run into a couple you know times when like you know you're looking at it and you're like wait this bug was fixed it was fixed ten years ago kind of looks like it's still there maybe it's not there you know so it does happen um, so the tests are there to prevent that um, and. Uh, yeah, it was a great project. Thank you, Cisco, and Hussein is not here. Um, that's about it. Any questions? All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, brilliant. And you just, uh, we just managed to find the slides. Um, thanks. Sorry for having missed that. Uh, so let's um, get this sorted. Mohit. Hello again. Um, so I have a mild cold, so I'll try that you won't have to hear me cough. Um, so this is my project, and next slide. So uh, as I talked before, so why is there a need for a separate sidebar panel for comments? So we already have this in the margin. So as you can see here, when the n number of comments like increases the it becomes very difficult to tell uh, which to which text the comment is pointing and and also uh, having a separate sidebar uh, makes room for more functionalities like sort and filter so yeah so my first task was to display them as threads so so how it works basically is, okay, so the SW Post-it Manager, it handles all the uh, processing of the comments. So what I do here is I collect the all the notes from the Post-it Manager and uh, I iterate through, the, iterate, uh, through it and uh, I find all uh, root comment of every comment. And then from there I create a new thread and uh, with the help of this method, I keep adding the its replies, and that's how I fill in the threads. So this is how it looks. Um, next slide, please. Uh -huh. So uh, after that, my task was to okay. So the old comment the, in the uh, comments in the margin is still going to be there for some time. So the task was to syn syn uh, synchronize them. So if you make any changes in the margin, so it has to, like the comment comments panel has to uh, show that change and update it. Um, initially, what I was uh, trying to do was make the uh, sidebar listen to the document itself so that if any change uh, 
happens uh, in the comments. So it will tell this sidebar uh, that, okay, uh, like change has happened and you need to update it. But it becomes problem uh, problematic uh, because uh, you can only update the uh, uh, comments in the sidebar when the post-it manager is done processing with them. So, okay. Um, uh, so yeah, um, and uh, the way it works, like, um, so the post-it manager also listens to the document, uh, and it's it's not. I don't, I'm not familiar like how to enforce the order of uh, when uh, the order of the notification. So we need that uh, post-it manager gets the notification first. Uh, it gets done with the all the processing, and then. Uh, Comments panel get notified and then it will update it. So, what I went with uh, was to make comments panel listen listen to the Post-it manager. So after it's after the Post-it manager is done with the processing of comments, it will notify the comments panel that okay, uh, like you need to update it, and it will then show that change in the sidebar. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, this is the sorting feature. Uh, so this is by default what we already have. Uh, it sorts the comments by the position. It's all, it was already there uh, by default. Um, next slide, please. Right, so this is sort by, uh, it, <laughs> sorting by time. Uh, so it's similar to how email clients sort uh, the comments in your inbox. Thank you. So, yeah, so it's similar to how uh, the email clients uh, handle the sorting of comments in your inbox. So, basically, the latest uh, email is at the top of your inbox, but not just that email only, but the thread uh, which contains that uh, email is also at the top. So, how it works is basically, yeah, you it finds the latest uh, comment, it uh, then it finds the thread which contains that comment, it puts that thread at the top of the sidebar and then, yeah, it goes, goes like it fills the older comments. So that's how it works. Next slide, please. So yeah, now on to filtering comments. So. Now it is possible to filter the comments by the name of the author, uh, also the date when the uh, comment was created, and also its resolve status. If it's resolve or unresolve, you can filter them by that. Um, oh, so it's, it's a little demo here. This is how it's by default how it and this sort by time and. So it you can like resolve it. It will get updated here as well. You can then hide the uh, resol resolved comments, and you can also hide the like info like time. Um, also, again, it will up get updated in the here as well. And yeah, th uh, this is how it filters. Oh, it's repeating again. <laughs> So you can go to the next slide if you want. Yeah. Okay, now so what's left to do? Um, so yeah, while I was working on this project, like I was using GTK3, which was default in my distro, um, and yeah, so I I was testing uh, it on GTK3 and throughout the whole project and. It was working fine. Then it got the code got merged. Then there were some uh, bug reports by Rafael uh, that it wasn't working as expected in when the VCL plugin was set to uh, Windows or KF5. So yeah, it feels like a huge oversight. Uh, but yeah, I'm still working on it to make it uh, work in different VCL plugins. So this is. Uh, 
I feel this is the main reason why the this feature is still in experimental. And yeah, the next was uh, like fixed crash when document has too many comments. So this was also re reported by Rafael when the project was still uh, in the progress. I don't know if it if it's fixed now because I didn't get to test it because I don't have any document with too many comments. Maybe I'll create one myself and test it again. And yeah, um, implement connectors. So if the comments in the margin gets uh, removed, we need a way to like sh uh, show in the document that okay that this some text has a, a comment. So it so it, yeah it's it's left to be implemented and yeah this is also a feature which is left to implement implemented is uh, to show different authors with different colors um and it has to be like customizable uh, as per the user request uh, so it i i started working on it uh, so i think it needs to like I need to make a custom widget for this. And yeah, I'm not sure how some stuffs work, like there's some class involved, like output device and uh, how it renders the custom widgets and how it will fit with all the VCL plugins and still need to figure it out. So yeah, I'm still working on it. And my main goal is to get this out of the experimental before the next release um yeah um so thank you all for um listening to me um and any questions Okay, um, well, that's um, putting, slowly putting us at the end of uh, the, the interesting content. <laughs> so let's uh, maybe use the time then to um, do a little bit of, uh, I skipped that at the beginning, um, um, but I thought uh, well, well, it's pretty much here uh, every single year, so but we can now um, maybe just uh, celebrate a little bit um, all, this, uh, all the things, the people, uh, and the uh, companies and institutions that make Google Summer of Code possible. Um, well, it's obviously sponsored by Google. Um, it's uh, providing stipends um, for projects of different sizes. It's open to anyone, um, mostly with the asterisk uh, 18 uh, or older. Um, and it started, um, it was, I think it was Christy Bonas' idea uh, if I'm not wrong, and it started very early, 2005, so it's like almost 20 years ago, with very small, with two, uh, 200 students, and it's now scaled up massively, so it's, I think, way past 1,000 students per year that gets funding, or uh, let's say mentees uh, that gets funding, it's, it's no, no longer just students, um, and some usually per year more than 200 uh, different organizations who get accepted and uh, get funding there. And LibreOffice has been part of GSOC from day one, from day one of LibreOffice at least. And before that, there was, uh, I think, uh, OpenOffice was part of it, and then OBuild was also part of it. Right, um, and it's a great way um, for, um, of course, for getting people uh, to work um, for a while full-time or mostly full-time an open source. It's a great way uh, to get uh, new people introduced to the project and bring them up to speed with something interesting uh, while they can pay their bills and, and their rent. Uh, and it's also a great opportunity for us as a project uh, to get interesting, nice features uh, implemented because we all, of course, we compete with all the other interesting projects. So we have to come up with uh, interesting ideas and then uh, find people to implement that. So um, big shout out uh, to everyone making that a su success, mostly to Google's open source office for sponsoring that. Uh, then, of course, many thanks to our mentors. Um, that's without the mentors, nothing of that would be possible. There's a substantial amount of time that, um, that mentors put into that. Um, so um, 
shout out to them. Thanks so much. Um, you see the names there. Um, yeah, it's ecosystem, it's TDF, it's volunteers. Um, thanks so much for spending your time. Um, and also shout out to Heiko and Ilmari for doing the boring job in the background with the uh, org admin stuff. Right, um, and that's it. So many thanks to everyone. Uh, thanks to you for listening and um, being here for one and a half hours. Anything else from your side? Any questions, any input, any ideas for the next time? Cool, then let's wrap it up. Thanks so much. And I hear there's gonna be some drinks and dinner downstairs very soon. See you there. <laughs>